Okay. Hello. My name is Chuck Fall, and I am uh, uh, an activist with Green Liberty Caucus. We are building a Green Liberty block. Uh, I have interviewed Emmanuel previously. Uh, there's a post at our Green Liberty Caucus website. We The theme is a truth politics, um, and Emmanuel is uh, uh, running for president. He's been running for president since 2020. And, um, and uh, we here at Green Liberty have uh, discovered him and find him to be a champion for all the things that we value and believe in. And so today, we're going to focus on an essay he wrote, a long essay, an 11 chapter essay, in fact, uh, titled How to Take Down the Billionaires. And uh, that is an incendiary uh, topic uh, title. Um, and what we're going to do here is we're going to do a rapid fire summary review of the 11 chapters. And uh, basically, Emmanuel is going to give us his uh, two minute, three minute elevator speech uh, and explain what each chapter is getting at. And then there will be an opportunity for our guests to pose questions and we'll have some um, some discussion, hopefully some dialogue and we'll um, get under develop our understanding of uh, the predicament of our times. And that's where we're going to start, because I want you just to kind of, Emmanuel, tell us why have you um, taken on this topic? What's going on with that? Go ahead, please. Right. Well, we we live in a profoundly controlled society uh, in which the uh, rapid uh, concentration of wealth over the last 20 years, and especially the last five years, has meant that a very, very tiny number of extremely wealthy individuals and families uh, have uh, almost uh, absolute decision-making uh, power over many of our policies within the United States and around the world. Uh, and so I wanted to articulate in this, how to take down the billionaires, a manual in 11 chapters, what specifically we need to do to rectify the situation and create a transparent, democratic and egalitarian society. Okay, that's, there's our summary. So let's, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go into chapter one and uh, I'm just gonna pepper my question with um, kind of some quick takeaways that I got uh, from mm -hmm. the chapter. The chapter one is titled, Assessing Our Position in the Middle of the Battle. Um, and so um, what are we the people um, dealing with um, in our in this quote, I call it plutocracy. Uh, right. Explain the main idea of chapter one. What do you want us to understand? Oh, well, I, I guess we have to start out by fully comprehending what we're up against, who these in, who the this group, the special interest groups are, uh, whether it's these major families like the Waltons or or the the Koch the Cokes or others, uh, or family, the, the Saad family uh, for House of Saad, uh, and what they're trying to achieve through their various networks and controlled uh, banks and uh, private intelligence firms and uh, consulting firms and media firms. And then where we are as individuals, we outnumber them vastly, uh, but we have been fragmented. We've been seduced by this sort of, how would you say, boiled uh, uh, sauteed in this narcissistic, self-centered culture for the last uh, 50, 60 years. Uh, and it makes it very difficult for us to pull together to make a long-term plan. Uh, and finally, we've we've tended to outsource things to other people. So we think someone else is going to do the hard lifting, uh, not me. Uh, and so although our numbers are, are far greater and we have greater assets, uh, we're not necessarily winning this battle. Okay, so let's just, I'm going to, in, an, in a nutshell, why is the billionaire class a problem? Oh, well, I, I think that if we read between the lines and sometimes explicit reports, uh, some of which have been declassified from RAND or DARPA, uh, it seems that there's basically an intention to uh, reduce us to idiocy, either by using technology or media, pornography, games, uh, pictures of fat cats and cafe lattes, uh, and then to slowly strip away 
our ability to participate in decision making in our community and to make us dependent on multinational corporations for energy, for food, and for how we communicate with each other through uh, multinational corporation controlled uh, uh, means such as Facebook or Twitter, or, or for that matter, Zoom, uh, although it's a little bit better in some respects. So we need to assess where we stand, what we're up against, and, uh, and then make concrete plans that we can implement. Uh, I'm really not interested uh, in, I mean, of course, election is a great way to get attention, but it's, it's not what we're ultimately about. Okay, I remember there was a movement uh, back in the 90s, I mean, end corporate domination. I mean, it's a right. it's an idea that is not a novel idea. It's been around for a long time. We talked about uh, the problem of the one percent uh, in the Occupy, uh, you know, Wall Street. Right. You've gone, you've kind of gone beyond just the one percent. You're really kind of homing in on the point zero 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 one percent, perhaps. And you know, just make that distinction a little bit because. Oh. So I, I think it's a it's a subtle issue, and of course Bernie Sanders was you know this our uh, pay to play uh, liberal uh, progressive in the Democratic Party uh, who used this expression all the time. Uh, so in, in, we're, we're in fact dealing with two aspects: that the actual domination of capital uh, and the control over policy is really the the zero point zero zero one percent. However. There's a whole body of people who are, you know, investment bankers at Merrill, at, at Goldman Sachs or at, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, people who are lawyers and technicians, et cetera, who form a larger sort of cloud, sort of like uh, um, bees or uh, um, flies buzzing around a, a dead uh, uh, hot pig's head. Uh, and so those, uh, form part of this in that they see their interests as being aligned uh, with that the super rich. However, I think ultimately in this battle, the super rich will be certainly have no hesitation in destroying all of those people who who trusted them, uh, thinking that they were somehow on the same side. Okay. Chapter two: the weaknesses of the billionaires. So you're kind of demythologizing uh the billionaire class because and i and i'll just tell you this very quickly um mm -hmm. american people i think generally um kind of like their billionaires uh, right. You right. Know, maybe someday i could rise to that level of accomplishment and achievement right. and 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 i wouldn't want to deny myself that opportunity to rise to that level in the future so i wouldn't want to take it away from them but you're challenging that and you're right. saying in fact, uh, the billionaire class is fundamentally a problem to our culture, to our society. And in chapter two, you make a, a, an appeal to Sun Tzu, you know, the author of The Art of War, and you start your argument there against the billionaire class. How can you argue uh, that the wealth of the billionaire class is a fraud? Uh, you claim they have no money, which is a paradoxical thing to make. Um, how does the billionaire class Use supercomputers. That's another highlight point you raise in this chapter. And how do we, how do we, the people, um, need? You say we need to make up the rules and change the rules of of our struggle here. So the the chapter two is interesting. It's intriguing. You introduce Sun Tzu and you make a, a kind of a war metaphor. Um, touch on these things in a nutshell. What's chapter two about? Well, that that's a lot. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I, I do see it as the equivalent of war. As soon as I, of course, my field is originally Asian studies. I studied classical Chinese, so things like Sun's the art of war is very familiar to me. Uh, and that need to understand, I and mean, what Sun Tzu stresses, both uh, who your enemy is, what their nature is, what their desires are, what they're striving for, and to understand yourself, your own weaknesses, your own misperceptions, your own indulgences that. Sun Tzu says, if you can grasp both, both who your enemy is or who the person you're, you're, you're struggling with is and who you are, then you are in, on the road to success. But if you don't get the two, if you don't understand who you are or you don't understand who you're dealing with or misunderstand, then it's quite dangerous. And the billionaires have spent 
I mean, they got to be billionaires over a long period of time. The research that dates back to the 1960s on how to make people stupid using media and TV. There's a lot of research done, as I mentioned, at DARPA on this subject. And, and basically, it's been quite successful. So most people are both uh, billionaires, Elon Musk or uh, uh, Bill Gates are glorified. They have spent billions of dollars promoting themselves. And the idea being is somehow they were entrepreneurs. They started in their in their in their basements or their their garages, and through their genius and the American way, they became billionaires, just as you could. This this is a, a clear fraud. Uh, mm -hmm. All these billionaires were were first. It wasn't about technology; it was about access and finance, uh, and it was fixed basically. Although there was some brilliance, I think, on people like uh, um, uh, I'm trying I'm blanking out um, Zuckerberg, right? some brilliance in his ability, how he played various investment banks against each other and was able to keep Facebook from being acquired. Uh, but this was not about his brilliance in technology or his vision. Anyone could have built the Facebook. It was uh, a rather the use of finance and then mentioning the issue of supercomputers. So supercomputers are used, of course, money is now calculated versus <laughs> by uh, supercomputers, people get, billions or trillions of dollars by cooking it up using derivatives and all, all sorts of other financial uh, mythical beasts that live in supercomputers. Uh, but supercomputers are also used, and this is a very, very important part because it undermines the whole sense of governance. Uh, they're used to track us. Uh, and this, this is something which is basically left out, uh, but basically, uh, the, the supercomputers, which the billionaires in these multinational corporations have access to, have extremely detailed descriptions of all of us uh, that allow them to track both individuals, groups, communities, uh, and the whole world, basically, hundreds of millions of people in real time. And they use this to anticipate what we will do. And they, they float all these sort of false uh, initiatives, things that you get in the Washington Post owned by Jeff Bezos, to test us, to manipulate us, to shock us, and to get us into a state of passivity and sort of uh, mental disorientation, which allows, that, that assures that no effective resistance will be organized. And that's, to me, that's the bottom line, is what we're about here is forming meaningful, organized, long-term, planned resistance, which will take them down step by step by step. Okay, and that leads into chapter three, formulate a comprehensive strategy. That's the segue. Right, and well, that's that's what I said, basically. Okay, well, then, <laughs> you know, maybe you've touched on this. And so basically mm -hmm. the billionaire class is a problem because in effect they have, they have if we can use an octopus metaphor, they have their tentacles in every aspect of society. In everything. We, we're all well aware of uh, the emergence of a national security state that's morphed into a full-blown surveillance state as a consequence of the 9-11 Patriot Act and so on. So you're simply making remarks about something that's well known. Many books have been written about this. Is that, is I, that I a think fair? There's one, the, one aspect which is perhaps not as well understood, and that is the similarity to what we found, say, with the German occupation of Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, and from 1940 on. And that was this plan to basically eliminate a large number of people for the Lebensraum, living room, right? And uh, there's there's plenty of reason to reading between the lines in terms of what's been written and what's actually been said off the cuff by people like Bill Gates uh, or Elon Musk uh, to believe that this is an agenda, right? Similar that in the way that the the European settlers to, to uh, South and North America from the 17th century, 16th century, 17th century on, planned essentially to take down these civilizations and destroy or reduce to slavery the rest, the populations, uh, that this is basically how we're perceived. So it's extremely serious. These guys are not playing, you know, uh, uh, plain, how would we say it, democracy, softball democracy. Okay. They're not playing softball democracy. And I, I think everyone on this call agrees with 
your yes. sentiment, we are all um, opposed to the globalist, um, the emerging globalist um, uh, techno totalitarian program. Mm -hmm. uh, we are again, uh, we are opposing the, uh, we want to exit the who, we're not going to, let's not uh, digress on really? that one, but, but so just to just, so part of your program is to formulate a comprehensive strategy. You evoke um, or invoke um, Martin Luther King um, in terms of his, uh, the, the movement he was building. Um, so just basically um, you talk about the comprehensive strategy, what you're proposing, and I'll just give the, the visitor, uh, listeners, you speak uh, explicitly about seizing assets, right. locking up criminals, on what grounds? Right. Okay, right. Um, go for it. Right, so in terms of the comprehensive uh, strategy, um, I'm not here to lecture you. I think the other people in this group here probably know many of these fields much better than me. Uh, and my, my purpose here is to try and bring us all together, uh, not to tell you what to do. I, I would welcome your contributions uh, to our long-term strategy. Um, in terms of the strong language, uh, I mean, it's obvious. Uh, if you or I made a plan uh, to kill off millions of people using bogus vaccines, or if we rigged up, you know, blew up a major skyscraper and used it to start 20 years of foreign wars, killing millions of people, uh, what would happen to us? <laughs> I mean, this is pretty simple stuff, right? I mean, I can tell you what will happen to you. If you survive, you'll be in jail and all your assets will be seized. That's what happens. This is not, you know, uh, uh, some radical position. So uh, we're, we're basically advocating, I think, together here, uh, that these billionaires uh, are citizens of the United States or citizens of their country, and they are subject to those laws. That there is no special uh, uh, off-limits uh, safety zone uh, for billionaires. But in fact, at this moment, that's exactly the case. There is a safety zone which has been created over, not, not recently, it's taken place over the last 50 years in which essentially a space has been created in which national law doesn't apply. And this has gone into, into hyperdrive with the COVID-19 operation uh, from 2020. So basically the first step in my mind is to first say, you know, you guys are going to jail these are your crimes, and, and, and it's not just me. I, I don't want to claim this is my, other people are, are pursuing this in parallel, and that I welcome. I have no interest in dominating people. You know, they pursue it. I support that to say we have to have concrete, the evidence, the charge and to make. So my only unique part is to say, I'm a candidate for president, and this is front and center in my campaign is to say, not just, say what Robert Kennedy say that vaccines are unsafe, but to say, you know, if, 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 uh, if uh, BlackRock and the wealthy uh, multi-billionaire families behind BlackRock uh, funded this, underwrote it and planned it, then all their assets should be seized, just as would my assets would be seized if I engaged in massive manslaughter efforts to make profit. And, and Part of our problem, I mean, Green Liberty Caucus subscribes to, you know, calling out state crimes and that part of our movement needs to explicitly identify these things. But the covering up of these uh, events has given the pass, I think, in some way that you're talking about to a billionaire class. And I'm, I've read The Devil's Chessboard by David Talbot tells the story of Alan Dulles. He, he, he served the billionaire class when he worked at Sullivan and Cromwell back in the day in that in that all got going. Chapter four, stop complaining. You're telling people, don't complain, organize, file legal uh, uh, motions uh, at the local level. Talk about stop complaining and get active. What does that mean? Well, I, I find this extremely frustrating. I, I People invite me to discussions or there are online sort of blogs and such. And people complain to each other in great detail about what's wrong, and much of what they describe is correct. Um, but it's a distraction, right, from actual action, right? And action would be organizing uh, groups of people who are closely like us, 
closely tied together, willing to take risk, coordinating their efforts in concentrated way for both the long-term, a long-term goal, and a short-term, what we're gonna achieve in the next battle. And that if you don't have that, that sort of, it, the expression I think is something like, don't complain, organize. Do I have that right? It's an old yes. phrase from the 1960s. Uh, but that's basically, we need to get away from that, I would say, narcissistic, self-indulgent, uh, cult of the self, complaining, and get to when something is wrong, make a plan, build a team, get to work. Uh, and, and if we work on it, we will get, and I don't think it will take that long, to the point where uh, Green Liberty Caucus has as much or more legitimacy than the federal government. And that's, that's where we want to head, is where we are an institution which is legitimate, which represents the people and which follows the Constitution. And these other things, calling themselves Homeland Security or wh whatever, you know, NSA, these things are not legitimate. They don't follow the Constitution. They don't represent the people. They have no legitimacy. They are the, um, the, uh, the puppets. The the um, of, of of this elite class. Okay. And you have a chapter titled "End Governance Secrecy." You open it. Uh, you make the appeal to JFK's um, April 1961 speech to the journalists. Very uh, famous. It opens with the, the the line: "The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society." Uh, Green Liberty Caucus, we're building a Green Liberty block, uh, is founded on accountability, transparency, protection for whistleblowers. And the fourth one that I don't say it in the literature is we need an independent media uh, to, to, to break the secrecy and talk, talk about why you're, why you're targeting secrecy as a problem. And why do you, why do you appeal to Kennedy? Well, I mean, Kennedy obviously was inspiring for me and I, I was born, whatever, 11, 11 months after his death. So even as a child, I had this image. I mean, I didn't really understand it, but there was, he had some sort of a vision. Uh, and I guess I felt sympathy since he, like myself, sort of in a sort of establishment, starting from an establishment background and being pushed to take this more radical position by circumstances to under, start to understand late in life, you know, how things really work and take a stand. Uh, but the issue of secrecy, I have been actually quite disturbed uh, that much of the alternative media and even the conspiracy websites don't really focus on what the true issues of, of secrecy and secret governance in the United States are. So there are three, as I put in the book. The first is the use of classified directives, which has expanded enormously over the last 15 years, but especially the last four years. And so uh, now it's not just uh, CIA and Department of Defense, but Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, uh, all sorts of organizations which uh, uh, um, are, have actually nothing to do with security now use classified directives. So you or I can be served with a classified directive that tells me what to do, and I'm not allowed to tell anyone I've been directed in this way. And this is how our whole political system has been destroyed. Related to that is what's called secret law. So secret law is passed by the Congress. Existence of secret law is not a secret. Secret law is the same legal power as federal law. However, you can't disclose it. You can be fined hundreds of thousands of dollars for violating secret law, even though nobody knows that you're subject to it. Um, so it's used increasingly in the United States. I obviously can't give you the details since myself don't know what the state is. And, and the third in some and is the most prevalent is non-disclosure agreements. So yeah. nowadays, if you're subject to some evil act of a corporation or the government, hard to separate the two recently, um, you are forced to sign non-disclosure agreements. It means it's all secret. Nobody knows what was done to you. Uh, and the so-called whistleblowers, you know, like Snowden or uh, I'm trying to think of the other, uh, 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 Assange, right? They're exceptional. Uh, and I think there's a reason why they're exceptional. That's a different topic. Uh, but most people who are in government or citizens 
who run up against these things and put their foot down and say, this is the truth. Most of them are just eliminated. I mean, not necessarily killed, but they spend the rest of their lives, you know, teaching part-time at community colleges. Their careers are destroyed. And this is all done through secret law and classified advise, advise, uh, classified uh, directives and actually non-disclosure agreements. And, and I'll just say that um, um, uh, some of us are on this list, on this call, are uh, followed 9-11 truth from the beginning. We all smelled a rat. We knew something was wrong there. It was obviously not what they were telling us. The yes. Department of Commerce has a law that in effect says anybody uh, employed in the Department of Commerce, and this covers everyone from air, airline pilots to the engineers that wrote the NIST report on Building 7, they have no whistleblower protections. They are not right. provided protection under that law. And, and so, so what you're raising is a very important uh, element in, in our struggle, and that is transparency, honesty. And we're not getting it from our current um, national security state. Is in effect what's right. happening? The so-called government. So-called government. National security law has now poured out of international into domestic and under the, uh, is my understanding, and um, the uh, Patriot Act opened the door to this. Actually, both are true. Uh, both, uh, I mean, breakdown of Thomas, uh, was it? And now I'm blinking on the word. Um, um, what, what's, the, what's the term from the Civil War? Thomas P uh, Posey. Oh, the, oh the, 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 they lifted the, uh, the well, they're, they're uh, basically corpus. saying that the military cannot be used domestically to handle uh, um, uh, domestic uh, Posse and comitatus. Posse and Thank you. From 1867, I think, or so. So basically now, Homeland Security is setting up fusion centers in Southeast Asia, in, uh, in, uh, in Central Asia, in, in South America. And so these FBI Homeland Security are moving out and making all these contracts uh, for sharing information for, for profit. And at the same time, the military is being authorized to infiltrate and to uh, engage and be privatized and essentially serve uh, these multinational corporations and billionaires at the local level using frequently uh, classified directives and secret law to shut people down. Big, big, serious problem. You are the only one on the presidential campaign circuit, I think, touching on this as deeply as you do. Uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, I'm proud of him for uh, raising truth issues in, in the things he's saying, but you are definitely going deeper. Chapter six, don't outsource the movement. Um, what does this mean, don't outsource the movement? You're suggesting people need to step up, take responsibility, right. take control right. of our liberation. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I think we have to think of it as the moral equivalent and actually literal equivalent of war. Of course, it's not war maybe in the way that we're used to it. Um, but often what we have is these, these NGOs set up uh, that then email you or send you junk mail asking you to donate on the assumption that you give the money to this organization, it will do the hard work for you, right? It will solve the problems for you. And, and this is, of course, uh, a fraud. Most of these NGOs are funded by a small handful of rich people following the corporate agenda. And then a lot of little fish like you sending in $25, which they totally ignore. And so they basically, they're a distraction. So the only way to organize real opposition that's capable taking back the government and restoring the constitution is to organize ourselves tightly and be dependent on each, you know, uh, uh, rely on people we trust in our group and expand that group. But I personally think this, this group, say 10 people here, is an excellent start. I, I mean, it's more than enough to put it <laughs> That sounds like Judith laughing. Judith, please mute yourself. Um, oh, sorry. All the guests, all First the guests, all, I appreciate it. all the guests should be muted right now. Um, Where is so, my mute? Where is my <laughs> mute button? We need to figure it out. Uh, Tom, please mute Judith. Okay. okay. So, I... so um, you've introduced chapter seven, 
and that is to form independent communities, to, right. to organize together. And, um, and I just want to point out that at the Green Liberty Caucus website, we have a button uh, that says libertarian municipalism on it. And right. I'm not going to go into Murray Bookchin's idea, but, but you, in the movement, uh, across this left-right you know, unity, right. if there is, and I think there is, there is this call for the the decentralization of power into, into communities, into Absolutely. independent money. So, so just touch on what do you mean? What are you getting at? Form independent communities. Is this realistic? You know, um, explain your vision. Suggest right. how this would what this how this would work. Go for it. So I, I'm not um, extreme sort of romantic vision of what agrarian America was. There were lots of problems in America. Humans are flawed animals from the beginning or flawed creatures from the beginning. Uh, so there's always been problems, but we have lost an enormous amount, especially since uh, the end of the Second World War in terms of our independence. We've been made uh, dependent on energy in the form of oil and gas and coal. Uh, we used to be, mo most farms used to be able to produce through windmills and water and labor their own energy, right? So we've become dependent on corporations for energy. We're dependent on corporations and on the Federal Reserve for money. Uh, in the old days, in the 19th century, even early 20th century, people were much more independent. Many families didn't even use money until they went to town, right? I mean, basically through, through your neighbors, through, through barter and other means, you're able to support yourselves. And so this loss of independence in a economic sense, in a food security sense, in terms of transportation, to be dependent on automakers and uh, petroleum companies, and of course, uh, roads and city planning, which is made in cahoots with automakers, right? To force you to drive, to try and get to work. Uh, I mean, the whole thing is a, basically a, a, a scam uh, to force us into dependency. So creating communities in which we can provide as much as possible to create our own food, make our own furniture, uh, and help each other will help us to become more independent. I do not say that assuming that we're going to be able to do this tomorrow or that all of us are going to be able to do it. But I think this should be a direction that we're going because the intention on the other side is clear. The intention on the other side is to dumb us down cut down our access to energy and to food and, and to money and to slowly starve us until we're ready to leap into the uh, prison that they have prepared for us because it seems more comfortable than uh, freezing in the dark. Okay, and, I, and so chapter eight, you have a title of chapter eight. It says, end the cult of the self and stop cor corporations from inducing narcissism. Just talk very briefly about that because we're running out right. of time. And we want to get right. to Well, we question. basically covered it. We basically covered, covered it. But basically, there's been a yeah. systematic approach based upon research which goes back into the 50s and in fact, even before into how to manipulate people by inducing narcissistic, self-centered behavior. And that that, is how uh, we're controlled. And that's is the famous book, Shear's book, that they thought they were free about the, uh, uh, the, the Third Reich, but basically saying, we think we're free. But in fact, through these psychological manipulation, through media and through entertainment, through music, et cetera, uh, we're not free at all. We're, we're profoundly manipulated people. Okay. And, I, and there's a lot of literature on that. Chapter nine, take control of the economy. And this is important. Um, and you talk, and, and, and we're gonna uh, in, speak further in the future about banking monetary reform. Right, um, right. You do have a criticism of quote, making uh, money, create money out of thin air. Um, you, um, and you've, and in this chapter, you document how the the billionaires function through the banks, intelligence ag agencies, how they're creating artificial wealth. You've kind of touched right. on this. Um, just, just what do you mean take control of the economy? What problems right. do we face? So, so some of you probably have a better understanding of economics than I did. I'm proud to say I didn't take one economics class as undergraduate, uh, and I think it's a false uh, science. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think bloodletting is maybe a little bit more effective, 
um, and astrology, I, I have a stronger belief in. Uh, but I, I take no offense if you studied economics, and I would be happy to learn from you uh, what we should do going forward to address this issue. But basically, uh, about money, you know, that money belongs to the people, uh, that policy should be set by the people. And I, I wrote a whole extensive paper on this, so I think maybe we should save that for another uh, uh, meeting. But basically, uh, the economy, if we're focused and we have a plan, we implement it and build out, we can slowly, and this is already happening. There are people out there in the United States who are taking control of their local economy and building up from that. It's already happening. Uh, it's the only issue I think is that it's it's not as well coordinated as it might be. Uh, but I have been impressed, especially in recent years, with the efforts of various people at a local level to actually start their own economy. Okay. Chapter 10, we're, gonna, we're getting up to our wrap here. Chapter 10 is, all these chapters are interesting and important. In this one, you talk about uh, titled Save the Intellectual uh, and Reestablish Education. Um, the title is Treason of the Intellectual. So you're very critical of the leadership, the intellectual leadership. Um, maybe this, uh, you are somehow um, invoking some of the, um, uh, the power elite story of- um, right. Uh, and, and so um, there's a betrayal that you're critical of. We need the intellectual class. Talk about right. chapter 10. Right. So I'm a card carrying intellectual and even establishment intellectual, having gone to Yale and Harvard. And so I, I'm, you know, I, I, I have to first confess my sins in that respect. Uh, but I, I do believe, I, I think it's a fact that not everybody can have specialized knowledge of all fields. Uh, and that working people are not going to be able uh, to understand national security, economics, uh, semiconductors, you know, energy production, et cetera. Uh, and so they're going to be, it's always going to be true that we're dependent on a group of highly educated people. And what went wrong in the United States, I think in some ways it has to do with the end of the Cold War, but maybe I don't fully understand it, is that increasingly intellectuals saw themselves as the um, aligned with, with the rich, essentially, standing on the side of the establishment and against ordinary citizens. And I'd seen this get, I was a professor. So I was a professor, University of Illinois, started in 1997. And I watched the process by which money increasingly ran universities and professors were no longer interested in society. And by the end, when I said we should talk to citizens, People thought I was insane, right? You should be publishing articles, uh, cozying up the people who get grants and getting your tenure at Harvard or wherever and, uh, and uh, playing the game. So we lost the intellectual class uh, and it, with it uh, went education. Now education has become uh, a coronation, right? You, you get this crown that allows you to get a job working at Goldman Sachs. Uh, but you don't actually have to learn anything. You just have to go through the hoops. Uh, and we see education increasingly being boiled down. I see at my, my alma mater, Yale University, a profound uh, drop in the quality of education for undergraduates. The facilities are beautiful. You know, all the colleges have been spruced up and they've polished all the wood. And, you know, they have uh, beautiful rose bushes that are trimmed. But the quality of education has gone down. The quality of teaching has gone down and students are increasingly being sort of primed, prepared for following orders and trying to live a indulgent, self-centered life. And this idea that somehow you have an obligation to country and society, or you have an obligation to know the truth, these things are vanishing. I don't think anybody undergraduate in these major universities, these expensive universities are being trained to think that I have a moral obligation to someone who's received this education, or that I have a moral obligation to know the truth. It's not okay to be fuzzy about what COVID-19 is. And what's the function of journalism in, in, in this? Uh, right, this, well, this... journalism is an extension of education, and right. it's more important in many respects, and so many people rely on some form of journalism to get their opinions. So uh, uh, obviously, uh, in the last few years, we've seen the beginning of a renaissance of journalism. 
people who write independently, who do extremely detailed, thoughtful uh, journalistic writing. And I've been impressed by this because it was not there before. Um, but most of the time, trying to figure out what's going on in the world, I, I sort of like a, it's like a puzzle, right? You have to read all these different sources, uh, uh, interpolate what's behind what they're saying, and try and get what these power elite are trying to achieve. Uh, so journalism as a whole has died into basically an extension of advertising. And we see this, obviously. I mean, I watched this back when I, mean, I started teaching in 95 at Berkeley. And I watched, this is 95, I think is when the New York Times went to color, right? And I, I saw this subtle shift where the New York Times lost. Not that the New York Times was great. It had lots of problems even way back. Uh, but it had certain sort of standards in terms of what they reported and the diversity of opinions. And after that, the New York Times became a sort of a medium for selling an upper West, uh, uh, West Side sort of lifestyle uh, to the masses. Uh, and that, that, or maybe Brooklyn, uh, but uh, that it, it lost any of that sense of integrity. And that, that I see across the board. And so building, uh, I mean, that's what I try and do. I try and write for a general audience. I give my speeches, but they really are articles to try and inform ordinary people about what's happening in our country. Okay. We're going to wrap up with chapter 11, taking the billionaires down one step at a time. Uh, this is the uh, you emphasize that uh, this can't occur unless the, the the information you explain in the prior chapters are attended to, um, right. especially the issue of the secret society. Um, right. You you envision um, a multiple uh, organizations. You um, uh, you you have the idea of a creating a, a temporary government, a provisional government. Provisional government. Right. You talk about identifying, naming names calling out uh, for malfeasance, explain chapter 11, and then we're gonna take some questions from uh, our uh, audience. Emmanuel, right. So chapter 11 is a little bit uh, sparse in detail because obviously uh, this is something we have to have a lot of different people involved in. But basically to say that we cannot take these people down overnight. Anyone, I mean, if Bill Gates is arrested tomorrow, I will not, consider that to be a victory. I would consider that to be, you know, the, the powers that be behind the scenes said, oh, let's just scapegoat Bill Gates, you know, and we'll go on with the party. So uh, the only way that we can get a more democratic, more transparent, more egalitarian society is by a slow step-by-step -step process in which we take back the, the foundations. And the foundations would be, above all, uh, a spiritual and intellectual independence in which the citizen is able to comprehend the world and think for herself or himself. And then independence in terms of your community, to have an economy which you have some control over, especially getting rid, getting, getting this money flowing in and out from multinational investment banks behind the scenes, which have basically taken over local banking for much of the country. And then uh, other aspects of how we take them down, getting the information out to people. I think getting information out to people is in a way the next step once we start to get these uh, communities, but it's, it's already taking place. I, I, don't, I don't claim to say these are all my brilliant ideas. My This sort of little manual is based on things that I heard from other people and which I saw other people doing. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I think the real step is to bring it together. And that's that's what my role is. My role is to sort of, for this transitional moment, to, to serve, serve as sort of like a, a way to focus together, right? Like you're, you're at the eye dot, right? something to focus on. Uh, but I want to make it clear to everyone that ambition and power is not my goal. Uh, I'm willing to take considerable amount of risk, uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I have no you know, financial interest in this. No one's paying me to do this. And in fact, I, like, like Mark, I took considerable financial damage for the for the effort to try and at least articulate another view. Okay, uh, we have a hand up from Tom Rodman, but we're gonna Tom, we're gonna go. Uh, Tom, if do you have a quick question, because we're gonna our, the deal is we're gonna go to. No, I, I, I'm a, I can go at the bottom of the stack. Okay, it's good. So 
So Tom has a question. Good. So so thank you, Emmanuel. You've um, uh, quite a comprehensive review. Um, I was intrigued that you're so courageous and brave and to uh, <clears throat> to speak what you're speaking to. Uh, I think you're. I think it's important, and I think it's something we need to be mindful of and 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 put on the front burner of what we're dealing with and what what's going on in society. Mark Goldman, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, so when we ask our questions, we're uh, coming on uh, the bottom of the hour and we're going to get about, we're going to push for 20 minutes and then we're going to end our, our discussion here. So let's concisely pose questions and then your answers, Emmanuel, also concise. Sorry. Mark Goldman, go ahead, um, please. Well, I, you know, I had uh, a lot of things come up during this discussion. The last thing he mentioned, or close to the last thing, one of the things near the end of your uh, your dialogue was uh, you were talking about setting up a provisional government. I'm trying to understand how that fits in with running for president. Um, uh, can you explain what you mean by setting up a provisional government and what you would do to do that? Right. So... Probably that's another seminar we should a discussion we should have. But to say it briefly, as I'm I'm approaching this uh, scenario uh, without blind optimism, I'm assuming a scenario in which someone like me can't possibly be president, and for that matter, Robert Kennedy can't possibly be president, and that we're going to be in this dead end. So the question is, do we say when we get to that point, do we say, oh well? We'll try again in four years or eight years. Or do we say we're going to go back to the Constitution and start to restructure, create our own government? Uh, and my personal opinion, this is just my personal opinion, although other people agree on me with me on this point, is that we're going to have to start creating a provisional government, that we, we're not going to be able to accept this corporate run uh, uh, technological dictatorship uh, anymore, that we're going to have to start building from the ground up a government, not just a movement that's going to elect candidates. Okay, um, thank that's you. That's a different subject, I think, maybe yeah. for another. And, and I and we're going to talk about. You have an essay on the provisional government theory, and mm -hmm. you know, even the Green Party has a shadow government, a shadow cabinet. People have played right. around with these ideas before, and it's, but it's it's. Yeah. It's a, it's, it is, we're going to return to this topic and this question and, and we'll, we'll flesh that out. Tom has his hand up. Let's go straight to Tom. Then others um, help me with the chat. If you have a, you know, I would like to go to, uh, let's just, uh, I do want to hear from John. John's made comments in the chat and as, um, but Tom, what are you thinking? Please. Uh, okay. Pose okay. Um, is my sound okay? At we least hear can you. you hear me? Do we hear okay. you? Okay. Um, so um, I, last night I, I heard a um, presentation about billionaires and in particular, these men with fetishes, uh, billionaires, uh, plus people in Silicon Valley, Valley and bankers all bankrolling the uh, trans movement um, and uh, pretty, pretty incredible stuff. Uh, it has to do with the high tech Big tech has the angle of transhumanism, you know, literally trying to transfer consciousness into machines. And of course they can, they can leverage this with, uh, you know, the medical technology, all the record keeping and uh, all the tracking. I, I don't necessarily need a comment on that, but it's just consistent with your idea of billion, this ridiculous amount of money. So I assume you're very much in favor of move to amend um but i guess my question or maybe what i'd like you to elaborate on is uh and this segues to the next meeting in the next meeting at the top of the hour we've got all kinds of activists wonderful people and a lot of them have lost their jobs because they exercised their free will to do what they thought was the right thing regardless of the cost and um there's a number of them that are like Meryl Nass. She's in Bath right now, which is a, a conference in England, and she's fighting to hold on to her medical license. Um, there's 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 like a dozen probably in that group that are, have been fighting, including Peter McCullough. We right. also have an activist in that group 
that is homeless because he realizes if he's homeless, they can't take anything away from him. He, mm -hmm. he works in, in England yeah. and right. uh, he, his name is Giza uh, Terry, I can't pronounce his last name, but he carries a thumb drive and on the thumb drive, he has all the evidence about COVID. Right. So when they arrest them, they, he has to, they have to take all this evidence. <laughs> yeah. So uh -huh. I guess what we're doing is, the, the, the flip side of this is most people, they get, they make this deal. They want to continue their lifestyle. They'll take the trans funding money because they don't really believe in it, right. but it helps their nonprofit. How do we get these people out of their comfort zones uh, to wake up? Uh, pass. Thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, Emmanuel. Right. So, so that's, I mean, obviously that's our job is to make this uncomfortable. That's why my language is not always so, you know, friendly, and I'm not a very good baby kisser as a politician. Uh, and I'd also say this also goes for, for the climate change issue. There's now a very large number of people who are taking secret kickbacks to say that the climate or the environment crisis is all a fraud, is all made up. You know, biodiversity is not an issue. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a big moneymaker for a bunch of people in the alternative media to say that uh, it's all made up. Uh, but I, I was there and I saw people, academics and government people who were dismissed from their jobs for saying that we had an issue with biodiversity or, or the destruction of the environment. Uh, so it was, these guys were not paid. We were not paid by, you know, billionaires. It was not a conspiracy. And the trans issue, transhumanism, transgender, et cetera, we will treat in another event. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, that's, yeah. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. We are going to visit the transhumanism and, and, and that very complicated topic that's coming up in the future. Um, John Olson, can I, can I, Press you to, to uh, okay. have questions. Okay. Well, not so much the questions as a comment. I, as I put in the chat, I think we're all pretty much congruent with the views that you've expressed here, Emmanuel. Uh, we, we're all uh, long-time activists uh, in this field, and uh, uh, one thing that always troubles me is the, uh, the the conflation by so many of fascism and communism. You know. Uh, the the, the um, former fascism is basically, uh, I command you obey or else. I mean, there's not much ideology, there's not much intellectual uh, anything. On the other hand, uh, the communism is, has a, a rich history of ideology, of basically empowerment of the working class. <clears throat> um, I'm a big fan of satire and ridicule that is good friends of our movement. And it occurred to me about that the story of the, the, the little boy who's, who said, the emperor has no clothes. I think that's a, a, a news uh, with the media. Uh, all of us grumble about not being able to trust the, uh, the corporate news and, you know, turn it off and all this. Well, I watch it some for reconnaissance purposes. I want to know what those guys are saying about the critical issues of the day. But I have my own, you know, solid foundation, so I'm not swayed by their 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 lies. But it seems to me that if if thousands of us began to tell them publicly, we can't trust you anymore. You're, you're wow. telling us BS. Get here. That it would weaken this pillar that is part of the foundation of the empire. Right. It's like the like like the um, like the. Um, the pillars of the the, the, the towers on 9-11 were destroyed, which is what right. brought the, the building up. So I, I kind of think of it in that capacity. You know, this is one of the pillars, is, is the media. Right. Over. Well, media and academics, I would say, they form a sort of a, a unit, education and media. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, John. Yep, no, Judith, you're there. You haven't been on for a while. Um, Judith uh, is a, quite the researcher. Do you have a thought, Judith, that you want to pose to uh, Emmanuel? Or you can pass. We're running out of time. We're coming to the top of the oh, hour. Go ahead. Judith, uh, if you can unmute, you're, you will have air time. I, I think Tom, Tom had muted her, so Tom has to unmute her, I think. I am but, unmuted. Go for okay. it. Okay. Okay. 
All right. So um, I assume that you have studied the past movements of rebellion and revolution. And uh, I wonder what lessons you've taken from them. If you could talk about uh, uh, um, strategies that you've mm -hmm. admired that you think perhaps oh. we might imitate from the past. OK. Well, that, that's a fascinating question. And I, I almost feel like that should be another uh, topic, what we can learn from other revolutionary movements, what they were successful and unsuccessful in, uh, whether we're talking about the American Revolution or the Civil War, Russian Revolution, or, or various Mexican Revolution, other efforts in the, 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 the Spanish Republic, et cetera. Um, and uh, I think it's always going to be hard. Uh, I mean, that's the bottom line, that uh, it's always going to be a, a relatively small number of people who are committed both intellectually, uh, have the ability to, to sort of organize and carry out these major changes. Uh, and uh, they, at the same time, they have to make a broad appeal to everybody. Uh, and I'm, I'm very afraid that what we're going to get is when, the, when people get over their trauma and start to come to terms with COVID-19 and 9-11, that it's going to inspire such a revulsion and such an anger that it's gonna be very, very difficult for us to manage it in a rational, democratic, rule of law manner. So that, that's my greatest concern at this moment. And it's, in some ways, it's similar to the problem that, we've, we've, that was faced in the Russian Revolution, where from 1905 on, there was this hope or the sort of democratic process and, and, and uh, uh, renewal, uh, but that the, the betrayal of the people in the First World War and the slaughter was such that it pushed the entire discourse to, to an extreme, uh, maybe required, but it, it really did uh, um, uh, set the Soviet Union on a, on a very um, limited track trajectory. I've, I've heard speculation. Am I still unmuted? Yeah, yeah we I've, hear you, Judith. Okay, I, I've heard speculation that uh, that the the plan of the power relief is to cause a severe uh, global economic crash, so that people will somehow be forced to adopt the digital currency and the great well, reset. And uh, do you think that is in the works? Oh, I think that's it's already started. It's clearly it's already started. Uh, I think it hasn't gone quite as fast as they they were hoping because there was a lot of people starting to get organized. <laughs> you know, you get people like us. You know, and now now we're just not that stupid, right? So there was some degree to which the billionaires and their advisors underestimated the ability of people to organize resistance. But basically, they got it right that the vast majority of people were totally asleep and they were able to advance this level. And I have, I mean, my own kids who use, you know, digital uh, payment systems really have no interest in uh, the question of what money is. Uh, and I think are totally unaware of this possibility in the near future that some emergency would result in just having all your money disappear. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna be a, a tremendous, Difficult task going forward. I, 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 I'm begging for your help. I'm begging for your help. Hey, Judith, great questions. Um, please mute uh, Marv. I'd like to hear from you. You're unmuted. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you just? Uh, you have a question for Emmanuel? A reflection? Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I'm thinking of this chilling YouTube last week or the week before this graduating class of Holy Cross was shown a 20 foot Zoom screen of Zelensky. Oh, yes. And they wildly cheered, the whole graduating class wildly cheered this uh, anyway. And I'm sure that 90% of the, those kids embraced the vaccination. I'm sure that 90% of those kids accept the terrorists of 9-11, the Muslim enemies. So anyway, I 
we we really need to work with people who think like us. We need to work with these kids who work with their hands. These kids in universities are lost. <laughs> How do there doesn't seem to be any any organizational uh, mechanism for this. The vast group of kids who are really far more intelligent than these college graduates. And sure. yeah, I um, anyway, I just uh, I mean, your efforts to reach people, I think, is commendable, but. Uh, we tend to focus on people who who are in colleges and that right, right. we, we got to focus a different direction because those people are lost. <laughs> good, good question, Marv. So basically, how do we reach people? I mean, we have to reach people in college. We have to reach people uh, who aren't in college. Dead. Uh, Tom has his hand up, so let's go ahead and respond just, to that, and then we'll go to Tom, and then we're going to well, wrap well, up. It's just a super quick comment. Yes. Drive to truck stops, meet truckers when they're eating and having coffee. Right. There you go. Yeah. Emmanuel, go for it. I'm there. I'm, I'd be happy to do a tour like that. Okay. Well, I just, so basically to, to pick up on Mars' point, I mean, you, you, in your essay, you talk about the importance of education journalism, in effect, part of our project, I mean, all we have is our, I mean, we, our First Amendment, our speech, our protest, our assembly rights, our, our petition of grievance, uh, you, you talk about all of this. So really, this is a very complicated project and it needs to happen on multiple levels and there need to be multiple points of engagement from multiple well-organized grassroots organizations. And that's what you're in effect speaking to, isn't that right, Emmanuel? Absolutely. I, I feel that the Constitution is really essential in this, that ultimately in this battle, it's going to come down to us saying that we follow the Constitution. The Constitution <clears throat> defines what the United States of America is, what the government is, and what it's not. And if you're not following the Constitution, and if you're part of some transnational uh, corporate financial intelligence agency, that you're, you, you, you have no say in how the government is run. And so that's, for me, that's why the constitution is so critical in this because we need some sort of compass to guide us through this maelstrom. Okay, I, I, and now um, uh, Mark Goldman, or Bernadine, you're from, uh, from Texas and we have Barbara, we have just a few minutes. Any Great. thoughts, reflections from Barbara Bernadine? Or if you guys would, you know, you can pass. Um, we're coming to the top here. Um, any any urgent questions for Emmanuel as we as we wrap up? You're all welcome just to chime in. If well, you I'm glad, thank you. So glad that you're doing this interview today. Okay, thank you, Bernadine. And I'll just tell you all. I mean, some of the people on this list are very strong on um, kind of. The, the trans movement and are concerned. And uh, Emmanuel, you, we've discussed that anything about trans really is under the rubric of the transhumanism project. And, and uh, uh, Emmanuel does want to connect and speak uh, to these issues. Um, that'll come at a later date. Um, so look out for um, future interviews, live stream events like this. Um, Mark Goldman, do you want to give us a closing remark? Uh, Mark and I are kind of the insider um, committee to support Emmanuel. Um, we're, we're and, Mark, very... and Mark ran for president, so he's the one who started this. Mark Goldman has run for president. We, he's got a website with quite a, uh, quite a library of, of articles, and right. um, we'll meet, you know, we'll have an opportunity for Mark to share. Mark, a, a final thought. Mark, you're going to wrap us up here. Would leave us with something encouraging and hopeful and uh, to think about. Mark. Well, that's quite a, uh, thanks a lot for the challenge. <laughs> um, I, I think that, that most, of the, most of the people hearing this right now are in alignment with what Emmanuel wants to do. And um, I think that uh, we need more of these conversations in order to kind of consolidate into uh, what's possible. And I think there is plenty possible. 
I think one of the great things that have happened is all the problems that you're identifying, because we now know that the, we now know who the people are and what the problems are, where there's a great amount of our history where we were totally unaware. And now we know what to address. Uh, and uh, But we have to focus on, uh, on what we know and what we've kind of lost in terms of our educating our children. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, I forget who it was that mentioned that, that our children are lost. I mean, I kind of agree that uh, we have lost our way in not uh, teaching them what does it mean to, uh, that we have a constitution? What, is it, what, is, uh, what does it mean to have freedom? And what are we going to do if we lose it? I mean, we need to... Uh, we, we we need to be uh, you know I I've always said truth honor dignity compassion courage and love is are the key words in transforming uh, our nation and most of the most of us uh, you know most most of us growing up uh, were never taught what those really mean I mean recently at least and uh, and so there needs to be a foundation of understanding of what's really important in life. And those will translate just the idea of truth, to be able to tell the truth no matter what comes up. Uh, these, This is what's going to change. Just the commitment and the understanding of how important that is is what's going to, uh, is to make a difference. Uh, what the strategies are, as Emmanuel says, uh, I don't know what all the strategies are, but we need fundamentally to reevaluate what we think is important and what we're and what we're obligated to to use our lives to create. And I'm going to say amen to that. Uh, that is a uh, excellent uh, wrap up, concluding remark um, from Mark. Um, I am Chuck Fall. I'm a proponent of Green Liberty Block, and we support the work of Emmanuel Pastreich in his run for president and his um, efforts to advance a national conversation and, and be a leader in a truth political, a political truth movement. And that's the work we're doing today. Emmanuel, I'm going to end the uh, recording. I want to say thank you very much. And, um, and we will be doing more of these in the future. Okay. Thank you. Chuck Fall signing off. Thank you. We're going to hang here for a second.